Oh man, you're supposed to under promise and over deliver. Um, so I'm kind of Johnny come lately to the cut flower world. I spent most of my career in extension um, along the Wasatch Front in Salt Lake and Davis County. I'm from the Valley up here in Cache Valley, but uh, I never gardened here as youth. So when I moved home about seven years ago, man, we're about three weeks behind what I consider normal growing season. And uh, I, I ended up going out and helping some cut flower farmers and dahlia growers and kind of got the bug. I, I, I thought it was kind of a, a fun way of, of continuing my horticulture knowledge. And so I want to preface this with, I am very beginning in the cut flower world. I'm usually around arborists and uh, pesticide applicators. So this has been a fun morning to listen to a lot of statistics, a lot of research. I uh, am a huge proponent in taking that knowledge and spreading it to the communities that I serve. And so, yeah, I learned about the NRCS um, high tunnel program through a, an event much like this, a webinar. And so after learning about it, I actually contacted the NRCS office and, and it's kind of funny, the, the guy that helped me, his name was Justin Elsner in the cash office. He's amazing. Their whole job is to help beginning farmers be successful. There's a whole host of grants available. So I just want to kind of walk you through the process. It's, it's a lot easier than people um, assume. It's not like, you know, as, as faculty at the university, sometimes we write grants that could be classified as a journal article with references and all this other stuff. And it's, it's pretty daunting. But these are set up for the homeowner. And so I just kind of wanted to walk through the process. Um, one thing you can go on their website, um, there's an NRCS office near you. There's, there's many throughout the state and in all states. It's a federal uh, program with the USDA and this high tunnel uh, system initiative. There's a video you can watch on how to, just all the how to's. There's all the videos out there to watch. Um, I actually contacted Justin Elsner this week just to talk about deadlines and, and application processes for this year. He actually responded and said, we're taking applications now. The deadline for this year is October 1st, and you would get the high tunnel for the growing season for 2024. Now, it's a, it's a competitive grant, so depending on the, on the funding they get it each year, they look at all the applications and they rank them according to what you're gonna be growing, um, what the, your property has been used for in the past. And one of the biggest misconceptions is that you have to have a lot of land and you really don't. Uh, this, this guy that I've been working with, he uh, is actually growing vegetables in his high tunnel. He's got a quarter acre lot. And so you can you can range in size that we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. But uh, further in his text, he said, our office also got grant money for urban ag in Logan City Limits that we're taking applications and grants for now. I'm also writing another grant proposal for small farm and urban ag for all of Cache County. So reach out to the NRCS office. There's programs out there that most people aren't aware of. Um, and again, their whole purpose is to help stimulate local economies and help to kind of bolster new and beginning farmers. Um, now, I was raised on a dairy farm. I wouldn't consider myself a new farmer, but I am new to this industry. And so um, we'll, we'll go through the process. It's, it's actually really easy. Um, so it's called an EQIP the Enver Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And again, it's an easy process to help, help you get started, especially when we talk about cut flowers. I've noticed in my high tunnel, I've had it two years now. And uh, man, you get a two to three week, sometimes four week head start on what's going out outside the high tunnel. So you can really manage the market of some of your cut flowers that way. But I'll tell you some other resources to towards the end of this. 
Now, it is a reimbursable grant, so you end up paying for the high tunnel. It has to be a commercial product. You can't just build your own scab together. But uh, when I built it that year, they were giving $4.29 a square foot. And so that equated to be about $5,000 offset for, my, and that paid for the kit, basically. And so it was not a lot of money out of pocket. Um, one thing, especially this year, we've seen a winter like we've had in the 1980s, a lot of snow. We've actually got about three feet of snow outside my office right now. Um, so if you are in a snow load area, they recommend a Gothic arch. And I'll show you some pictures and they'll give you actually a little bit more money to have a higher quality high tunnel. So the, the first thing you need to decide is what crop you're gonna be growing. Are you gonna do it for vegetables, cut flowers? You could do a, a variety of approaches. I've, I've had a lot of people ask me about fruit trees and getting crops early. And it's actually not a very good idea because too early is too early. And you'll get a lot of freezing at night temperatures if you premature uh, bloom some of those fruit trees. But again, I'll show you a lot of research that's been done through Melanie and a lot of her specialist colleagues, Brent Black and Dan Drost, and a lot of the crops that, that we've tried at the university. So do your homework. You can go clear up to 100 foot 150 feet long on high tunnels. You can go 30 feet wide and span. You can go as small as 14 feet. So it's really a choose your own adventure as far as size goes. Um, there's a lot of different companies out there. And with the university, we don't ever recommend one over another. But th this is a list of very um, common commercial high tunnel um, producers and suppliers. Uh, on this slide, I actually opted to go with Roberts Ranch on mine. They're, they're local um, down in Spanish Fork area. It actually ended up saving me about $1,500 in shipping costs because that's another cost that you have to consider. But again, I've got neighbors that do cut flowers and they went with another company and it, they're really good, high quality um, products. And the NRCS office will help narrow things down for you if you ask them. Okay, so this is what comes in a kit. You'll get the ribs, which are the basically the hoops. We get the purlins that strengthen those hoops and everything that comes with that. The U-channel, the wiggle wire, the plastic, the greenhouse plastic that rates for about five to six years. Um, it's for a good plastic, it needs to be about six mil and that's usually what comes with them. And the fabric clips and roll up mechanisms on the sidewalls. So the rest of this presentation is just gonna be pictures, how I did it, how I put it together, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end for, for questions. So <laughs> this is kind of how it came. I went down and grabbed it on a flatbed trailer and brought it home, put all the pieces out. And it's kind of like playing with Legos as a kid. It's just kind of snap things together, put it together. Um, got my kids involved. The number one, um, after this slide, the number one thing I'll tell you is to get people involved. To do it yourself is insane. Um, so I got my kids involved. I got some master gardener friends involved. But tool-wise, you don't need a whole lot. A drill, a level, um, socket set, if you, if you get want to get fancy. I tried to level mine up as best I could, but uh, we'll just go through the process. So I mar marked out an area of my yard where I wanted it. I tilled it up, killed the weeds for a while because I've got a really bad uh, perennial weed problem. So I controlled weeds for a season, tilled it up. You can see there's a lot of rocks. This was an old driveway area. So my kids ended up picking up a lot of rocks that they still haven't forgiven me for. But then you measure out, drill the holes for the posts. The posts come in four foot sections. You'll bury those. They recommend on these kits that you cement in the corner posts on each end wall. I get a ton of wind where I live. So I actually cemented in every post. I over-engineered everything that I did because I only wanted to do it once. Um, and I've seen a lot of high tunnels around 
um, catch flight if the, the winds pick up underneath. So the other um, thing I learned the hard way is before you put up the ribs and the posts and everything, work in as much organic matter as you can to begin with. Get the soil prepped and ready. Because once you get the structure up, it's really hard to get machines in it. And so you can see I've built the beds up beforehand, started putting the, the, uh, the ribs up and the purlins. Now, full disclosure, the next few slides are not OSHA approved. The way I put this up was not uh, recommended, <laughs> but it's what I had. And so I, I put everything up with a tractor and a bucket. It was not safe, but it worked. Um, you can see the end result. I used um, pressure treated lumber on the base because it's gonna be in contact with the soil and moisture a lot. And that's rated to last over 20 years. So consider the materials you use. The kit that, that I got came with hose clamps to put the, the ribs and purlins together. I wasn't really fond of that idea. So I actually went online to the greenhouse supply company and bought some of these hose clamps and per purlin brackets. And they actually work really, really well and they're easy to put together. Um, putting the wiggle wire on and the in the hip boards. Hip boards, there's you'll get online and you'll hit you'll have a lot of um, options, a lot of opinions on how high the hip board needs to be. I wanted to have a lot of airflow, so I put mine about three and a half, four feet. And then that wiggle wire channel, I'll show you what that's for later, but that's that holds the plastic. But again, more hands make light work. The one thing the kits do not, do not come with are the end walls. And so that's the one investment that I put in. And um, because they're usually indoors under plastic, I just went with a fur or just a regular two by four material. If you want to use more weather friendly, you can use cedar, but it tends to get quite expensive. I did use cedar on the outside where it does come in contact with weather. But the other questions you need to ask is when you're building the end walls is do you need a vent system? I didn't think I did, but two years later, I'm telling you that I do, and I'm gonna have to cut one in because the summer, it just gets way too hot and unbearable inside. So vents are a really good idea. Doors on either side to increase air circulation. Um, and then if you want windows. So I'll, again, not OSHA approved, but putting the end walls in, it. There's a lot of really helpful technology and products out there. This is a, a product that I found at a greenhouse supply um, online store where you can put the purlins and the ribs together with two by fours. When you put the, the end walls up, you'll end up stretching the plastic over the end wall first and then over the, the rest of the hoop house afterwards. But you can kind of see I went a little bit overboard on the headboard because I wanted big barn doors that could open clear up. Um, but that's kind of the next phase. Putting the plastic over the top, this is where a lot of people come in really handy. I, I laid the plastic along the side of the high tunnel and tied tennis balls on string over the plastic. The one thing that, that I would recommend also, having learned the hard way is Wherever your brackets come on the upper side of your ribs, get some duct tape or something to smooth over any rough edge because it is metal and you drug that plastic across it and it will tear at times. So any hard surface or screw that's sticking out, make sure that there's no uh, rough edge as you pull the plastic over. That's the tennis ball we threw over. YouTube became my best friend. There are so many helpful videos out there on how to's that I, I would end up watching more videos than actually doing the, the building part, but it saved me a lot of headache later learning from other people's mistake. So how to do the wiggle wire. I know that it's probably common knowledge to people that build greenhouses, but this was the first one I'd ever done. And so I watched how the wiggle wire worked in the channel. And, and then once I did it, it was, it was fairly simple. Um, 
So don't be scared to, to ask a lot of questions, search the internet for YouTube videos. Um, the curtains, that was kind of daunting for me to, to how to have the curtains roll up evenly. Uh, the biggest trick I learned is to have the plastic lay loose along the side of the high tunnel and then lay the, the bar on the high tunnel base, at, right at the base sideboard. And then there's clamps that will clamp the plastic. And then once you do that, you can just get the hand crank, hook it up. There's automatic hand cranks. I didn't want to spend the, the money to get those. So I just have, because I have kids at home, I just call them and say, turn up the high tunnel. And they run out and crank the walls up. They probably complain about it, but they have to pay rent somehow. Another handy item that I found was um, on the, the billow curtain string that helps the, the curtains not fly away from the high tunnel. Um, these, these are hooks that slip into the wiggle wire track, and then you can tie those down to eye hooks at the base. Now, I would get a very strong rope. Again, I, I used what came with the kit, and I thought it was a really strong nylon rope, but in a really heavy windstorm, it's broken a couple times, and that billow curtain will just swing in the air and come back and slam against the high tunnel. So use high quality materials. Um, it'll cost you up front, but it's worth it in the long run. This is the um, roll up curtain. They're hand cranks. Uh, the other thing I learned the hard way is if, if you don't get your tunnel level, and you roll the curtain up after the fact, you'll have a high end and a low end. And so it doesn't close all the way when you when it's closed. And so you'll end up with air pockets and areas where the, the wind can come in and, and damage. So even, even building, you'll end up going back and fixing some stuff and learning as you go. Um, this is some of the wiggle wire track. It's really, really handy. I just had my kids hold down on the plastic as tight as they could. And then I would put the wiggle wire on and it holds it in place. It's uh, technology has come a long way. That's all I've got to say. Um, to help with the, the positive pressure on the inside of the high tunnel as it warms up, it, the air expands. Um, I ended up putting some furring strips on the outside of the high tunnel and screwing that through the plastic and it helps that plastic not bulge as much. These are the Anything on the outside of the high tunnel, I did use um, cedar because it's got the natural rot resistant properties. But again, do some homework, look at the NRCS, contact the person involved. Uh, there's one in, in, in every county that are a lot like the extension offices. Um, so find your state, find your local county, do a quick search in in my area, you can see the North Logan field office, Justin Elsner is the contact. And if you don't know your contact person, just call the office and say, I'm interested in the high tunnel program and they will direct you to who you should talk with. Now, uh, let me back up. Justin was really helpful. He came out and did a site visit. They have a, a ranking on the applications where they ask if you're growing there currently, they help you through the process. And then they come out and make sure that there's no environmental uh, runoff issues, bodies of water, that the slope is, is will work. And so it's a really simple process. They actually came out to my house and looked at the site while I wasn't home. Um, the reason I know that is they talked about that that dog was in the picture earlier, laying in the front of the high tunnel. They're like, oh, your dog's so friendly. I'm like, when did you come to my house? But, but they told me about it when they told me that I got the grant. So the other thing to, to mention is I didn't get the grant the first time because there were so many applicants, but they called me and said, you didn't make the first application. Would you mind if we put it through the second round next year? And so it took me two years to get the grant, but it, it was an easy process. I, I really thought it was a, a no mess kind of situation. So First year I got it put up, I just enjoyed going out in the winter and feeling 60 degrees on a warm, sunny day. And uh, 
So I started um, doing some re uh, research with, with another specialist on campus about some strawberries because uh, it was an empty hoop house and I wanted to learn how to grow. I'm a very learn by doing kind of person. I could listen to these conversations all day long and not learn anything. But if I do it one time, it's stuck. And so I grew strawberries for a season. Last fall, I, I planted two rows of peonies and I'm starting in with some delphinium. And so just barely starting to dabble in the cut flower world. And I'm really grateful. I've got some great neighbors. I actually am, am neighbors with Lindy Bankhead with uh, Paisley Flower Farm. She's held my hand through a lot of this and told me some things I should try. Um, the one thing is on drip systems. It, it's the best way to water a high tunnel. It's, it's efficient. You put the water where you need to. Um, I've learned a lot. And uh, actually, we've got a, a fact sheet on drip irrigation coming out this year, hopefully, because of a lot of lessons I've learned. Um, this is a, a very pliable drip tape that a lot of farmers use in the out, outdoor situation. But what I found is anything above 15 PSI, it explodes. And so I actually ended up having to go back to a Nidifin system that's a harder wall drip tape because my high tunnel is only 24 by 48. And so it's just not a, it's, it's way too much pressure in the high tunnel just to do that tape. So again, a lot of learning. Um, I wanted to end with this uh, website. If you, if you do a Google search for high tunnels USU, there's all the research that's been done on construction types of high tunnels, and then as, as well as all the crops, like all this stuff that Melanie's been doing with cut flowers, Brent Black's been doing with strawberries and fruit production, and Dan Dross has done some stuff on asparagus and vegetable crops. There's more information on this website than you could go through in a day. So that's basically what I have. I'm happy to, to take any questions, um, but don't be surprised if I say I don't know. Oh, well, thank you so much for walking us through the process. And it's just amazing how much funding um, the NRCS can help provide. And in the game changer that high tunnels are for cut flower production, from the timing of it to the quality that we can get to the increase in yield. Um, so I really appreciate this presentation a lot. So we've got some technical questions for you, JD. Okay. Um, the first one is two questions. So I'll just read them individually. Uh, high tunnels, what if you are in high wind and snowy conditions? Um, and actually, I guess the second part is footings for recommendations, concrete, so are permits required? So what are the extra precautions you use because you are in a windy, snowy location? Yeah, I have both of those conditions. And, and that's why I used, it's like a quick creep post mix. I would put around each of the um, posts as I put them in the ground. Um, Technically, you only have to do the, the end walls, but I did every one because of my knowledge of the high wind areas. And uh, I've got a neighbor down the road that, that he just did the end walls. And this last year, somebody left the door open and the wind came in and billowed up and pulled all of the ribs up out of the ground. And so I think a little extra at the, at the onset is worth it. It helps me sleep at night when I hear the wind. Um, the, it's it's kind of interesting. The weekend I finished my high tunnel, I buttoned it all down and I went out of town on a to a conference in uh, Missouri. And my wife said that weekend we had the biggest microburst windstorms, and she was so worried that I was going to come home to disaster. And it it was fine. The one thing to consider in high wind areas is to make sure that it's buttoned down, like the the end walls are down, the doors are closed. Because they can withstand, this Gothic arch can withstand immense pressure and weight with snow. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit more on the end walls? There was a question about the pros to adding or maybe why end walls are needed in the first place. Uh, are they necessary for growing flowers successfully? And then just the plans that you, how did you build these end walls? Did you come up with that yourself? So the, the plans came actually with the kit for the end walls and it. And what it does is it adds structure to the whole unit. It, what you'll notice is you put the ribs up, you can actually come and move them. 
and, and if and I could understand it in a windstorm, if you just had plastic on the end wall, there's not a lot of structural integrity. So the plan actually came with the kit. I tweaked it because I've done building in the past and I wanted, I wanted that solid bottom just for ornate reasons. It matches a lot of the other structures in my yard. I have a chicken coop that looks similar and I'm just kind of that way, little OCD. And so, yeah, the, as far as the framework, it comes with the design, but I added some stuff for my barn doors. I wanted a little bit more rigidity. So I used that header that's 12 inches. And so I ended up tweaking a few things, but on the other end, the, the end wall on the, the sunny side, I didn't have a wall. I left as much plastic as possible, but there is still that framework that came with the design. Excellent. Um, so you really do need end walls uh, for the structure and also just to be able to heat passively through the sun and keep that heat in um, for growing crops and having that benefit. Um, would you speak more to picking out venting and fans? Would you also speak on how to automate side lowering and raising? So the reason I did not automate is I don't have power in this area of my yard. And most automated um, roll-up doors run off power. Um, it would be really nice, but I just didn't want to go through the expense of running power to that location. And it's it's easy to roll up the window the the sidewalls. As far as venting, a lot of those run on power as well, but there are a lot of passive vents that run off um, louvers that are heat exchange. They have um, cylinders that have wax in them. As the temperatures rise, that wax expands and pushes the louvers open. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with those yet. I do need to install them. Because like I said, the two things I learned last year in growing in that high tunnel is the nighttime temperatures are the same as the outside. So you don't get a lot of cold protection per se. The plants can handle that three week head start usually. But the other thing I learned is midsummer, it's way too hot. So I need to vent and I also need, actually need to purchase the 30% shade cloth to go over the plastic in the summer. So there is some investment, but the NRCS offset $5,000 of the $6,000 it cost me. So hopefully I can make that thousand bucks back this year and cut flowers. Yeah, absolutely. So you're getting a lot of compliments, by the way, in the chat and other places about just how beautiful your tunnel is. So I want to point those out. Um, and especially in thinking about cut flowers, a lot of our growers are doing agritourism type um businesses and so thinking about this even as an event space when it's not being used for flowers is pretty amazing um okay how long did it take you to build your tunnel so remember the ocd part <laughs> it took me two months because i worked at it two hours at a time um that's the other thing i wanted to point out i'm not in this to make money i'm in it for education I want to be able to help the growers in Northern Utah and the high mountain valleys. And I can't help them unless I know what I'm talking about. So that's why I put the high tunnel in. Um, my neighbor, um, Lindy does a ton of cut flowers. She does a lot of annuals, a lot of tulips. And I, my busiest time with work, cause I work full time is the same time as the cut flower harvesting. And so I've actually opted to grow perennial um, flowers, because I can't go in and work the same level as some of the cut flower growers. So I, I'm not worried as much as, as making money as I am just learning the process. Oh, and we're so thankful for that. Um, I want to just note that Brent Black, who's uh, the fruit specialist here at Utah State and has done so much high tunnel work, brought up that there are some 12 volt Volt automated systems to roll up the sides that work on a solar panel and a car battery. So another option out there. Um, a question, how hard is it to change out the plastic sheeting? Um, I, I don't think it would be hard. You have to do it on a still day. Any wind, you'll end up in the next valley. But uh, <laughs> I think two to three people could pull the plastic fairly easy within an hour or two. I've, I've helped some neighbors do it and it's not that big of a deal, especially with the wiggle wire. 
So I know we're at the top of the hour, but if you don't mind, could um, we continue answering some of the questions? You bet. Awesome. There's a few about the orientation that you used for your high tunnel. Um, does it matter going north, south, east, west? And what is the direction of the prevailing winds on your property and maybe relative to the picture that's showing? So knowing Brent and you are on here, you could probably answer that better. <laughs> I, I think paying attention to the way the sun rises and sets, you'd want the broad side of your high tunnel facing that aspect. Mine doesn't. Mine faces north and south, so I probably put it wrong, but that's the way it fit on my property, and I don't think in Utah we suffer for any lack of sunlight, and because the structure is all um, plastic and, and I get plenty of sun, I don't worry too much about it. Now, the wind aspect, that's what, that's what I considered the most in, in putting my high tunnel up so that the wind hits the smallest side of my high tunnel. Um, but because it hits my end wall, it billows the curtain. So now I've got to figure out on the inside how to double curtain the corners so that I don't get a lot of that draft. So there's always problem solving that mm -hmm. has to occur. It's always an experiment every year, I think, that we can refine the process and it gets better and better. Um, so now there's some questions about kind of pushing the high tunnel. Could you raise tropical type trees and flowers like orchids and ficus in there? I don't think you could unless you had a supplemental heat. And we have a full on greenhouse at Kaysville and the cost is astronomical. And especially with fuel prices, I don't think it would be worth it. This is more of a passive system that extends the growing season in the front end by about a month. And then you can extend it on the tail end by about a month. So in Cache Valley, having a high tunnel, I can grow like I'm in Kaysville again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, it's, I'm really excited. Uh, Shannon, my student and I, we, um, or former student, I should say, we are working on a high tunnel microclimate paper where we're studying the temperature effects depending on where you are in the high tunnel air temperature, things like that. And the thing to remember is that if you're not using heating and you're just relying on sunlight, it can get really hot during the day, but at night it's falling to near near the temperatures that are outside. So to trying to grow tropical things and so forth is really difficult. And as JD said about heating, it's really expensive too. When we've done some enterprise budgets on heating um, to push peonies, we, we lost money on it um, because of the cost of heating. But if you do go with heating, Heating the soil is a lot more efficient than trying to heat the air because the, the soil can hold the heat. Um, all right, let's see here. Have you considered high tunnel shade requirements for summer? Maybe this is an alternative to forced ventilation. You kind of answered that one already that you're going to yeah. turn it into a cooling structure, essentially. Yeah, I need uh, to do both. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you get to choose the height of the tunnel or is that relative to the length and width that you get? I think you can choose it somewhat um, with the sidewalls. You can adjust how tall the sidewalls are, but the arch itself kind of dictates somewhat. And I wanted it tall enough to, to pull machines in if I needed to, to till and, and do other things. So I left it as high as possible. Could you build this on a sloped landscape by excavating the high tunnel, um, the high side of the slope or building up the low side? Yeah. You, yeah. So the, so the hill that mine is on has a, a fairly decent slope. It's a 2% a grade. And so I ended up digging the, the tail end of my high tunnel into the hill. And then I double stacked the two by two bys to retain some of that hill. So I did that a little bit, not as not as drastic as maybe the question indicates, but yes, you can as long as you hold back the hill. Um, is a Was a building permit required for putting the high tunnel in? It's not. There's no building requirement um, because it's not considered a permanent structure, but it is a good idea to check with your city and and neighbors. Um, here is a question from a grower here in Cache County. Do you do consulting on building tunnels? 
Um, I consult as part of my job. So with extension, that is our, our complete mandate through the university is to serve the community. So I do between 70 and 100 consultations a year. I'm happy to come out. Um, my, inf my contact information is on this last slide. Send me an email. I'd be happy to come out and help. Oh, we are so lucky to have you as a resource up here. Um, I, we're getting to the end of the question. So there was one about, do you use any hanging baskets? Do you, would you use your yeah. tunnel for that? You can. I just haven't yet. The sky is the limit. <laughs> um, but also keeping in mind about just what the temperature is doing and at night, and if you're higher up in the in the tunnel versus close to the soil surface, there's going to be differences with temperature and lows and so forth. Um, yeah, and, and then the last question on that, that tunnel.usu.edu yeah, site. Go take a look. We have another shortcut to get to that website, uh, flowers.usu.edu, and it all links back to the same place. Um, and then the final question is, have you heard about applying a weak clay solution to cut down on solar intensity? Yeah, um, I used to work at a, a greenhouse facility down in, in Layton area and midsummer they would paint that stuff on and then it, it does a great job. It's messy but it's it's more of a, a fine clay that that's a powdery white and they'll spray it on with water um yeah you can do that or the shade cloth i like the shade cloth better because it's not not as permanent it's kind of like the the fruit tree wrap that's the physical wrap versus painting mm -hmm. So another question came up about, have you ever looked into geothermal or know where to find more info? Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that access at my house. I know that at the Botanical Center in Kaysville, they've tried digging down six to eight feet and running tubing to run it up, kind of a passive warming system. Um, so Sheridan Hansen down in Davis County would have more information about that and how that's working. Um, the geothermal sites that I know of are just naturally occurring, um, but yeah. that would be worth doing some quick searching. Excellent. Well, thanks for staying on with us an additional eight minutes to answer all. Oh, there's more. Um, there's more questions. One other one. What was the total cost uh, for this after receiving the grant? If you could repeat that. So the grant covered five thousand dollars. It was four twenty nine a square foot, and so that covered the kit, the plastic, all of the hardware. The only thing I ended up purchasing was the lumber for the end walls, and so that, because of lumber prices, it was during the peak of inflation two years ago, and my lumber was about eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Wow. 